but other religions, some have, have grown and picked up members and things. And so the experts were basically saying as much as, much as different people are saying religion is going to die at some point or people are going to stop believing in these things and it's not that important, it's actually growing. And uh, that's the conclusion they, they, they came up with. But I would say that not everything is worthy of worship. That we ought to be more particular in the things that we, things we worship and, uh, and what is really worthy of worship. Pastor Arthur J. R. Vassar, he says, One day I was in a, doing a prayer walking through a large Buddhist temple when I witnessed some, something heartbreaking. A large number of people, very poor and desperate, were bowing down to a large golden Buddha. They were stuffing what seemed to be the last of their money into the treasury box and kneeling in prayer, hoping to secure a blessing from Buddha. On the other side of the large golden idol, scaffolding had been built, and the Buddha had begun to deteriorate, and a group of workers was diligently repairing the broken Buddha. I took in the scene, broken people were bowing down to a broken Buddha, asking the broken Buddha to fix their broken lives while someone else fixed the broken Buddha. Like there's just kind of a, a story to be told there about some of the ridiculous things that we worship or hold up. But the author here goes up and says, the insanity and despair of it all hit me. He says, but we're no different from them. We're not more advanced than them. So we are broken people looking to other broken people to fix our broken lives. We are glory deficient, people looking to other glory deficient people to supply us with glory. Looking to other people to provide for us what they lack themselves is a fool's errand. You know, isn't that how many times are we looking to a spouse or looking to a relationship or looking to a person to help us feel more fulfilled or meet our needs when there is really just only one that can meet those needs? There's only one that can fulfill us. There's only one that can fill that vacuum uh, that space in us that so desperately needs the Savior. And at Christmas time, we celebrate the birth of of the one and only holy living God, not a statue, not someone that's in a grave, but someone that's actually resurrected from the grave. And we, we, we celebrate that because he rose, rose from the grave and, and, and loves us and provides actually the power for changed lives. And that, that's worthy of worship. Now, Americans, we miss worship, I believe, for, uh, for a couple reasons. One is I believe that we're just such a busy and distracted people. Like the, this morning, I believe there's probably people here thinking, okay, let's get done with this message, get out of this worship service, because we've got a whole, whole lot of Christmas shopping to do. We've got to put the lights on the tree. We haven't got the lights up on the house yet. We've got to do this. We've got to get after that. And this is a busy season, and we're, you know, times are burning. And, and, and for some of you, that's, that's right where you are right now. Some of us, you know, we just, we got things to take care of right after church. We got sick kids. We got a lot of people that, you know, they're, they're hurting right now. We got to go different places and take care of these things. And, and we're just busy. We're distracted. It's hard to kind of come to this point. There's this a quietness, a pause to quiet our heart and worship the Savior. Worship the one that was we celebrate that was born at, at Christmas. And, and it's really important because of all these things. We know that about the culture, that pastors, we need to be time conscious, right? Because people are going to spend uh, more time worshiping than, than they think is necessary. There's time, you know, that, that, that they think they should. And so we need to be time conscious. And, and so I, I spoke about to last week um, to my daughter, Allison, she's a seventh grader, my oldest. And I, I asked Allie, I said, how, hey, how was the, the message this, to this Sunday? Did it seem long-winded? Were you able to pay attention? And she said, yeah, Dad, it was all right. I said, so it was easy to understand and you enjoyed it? And she said, whoa, 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 Dad, I, you know, let's not get carried away. I, I love Allie. She's so sweet and honest, <laughs> kind, loving, just like her mom. But not only do we miss worship from busyness and distractions, and, but many just don't know what worship is. But many of us, just kind of a weird idea still. It's, there's kind of a vagueness about it, like, worship, you know, I... I guess that's something some people do, and, and some of us are still kind of like, we're wondering if there's some kind of feeling or experience we have to have in, in our body, and that's when we'll know when we worship. Some song kind of touches your heart in a way that kind of gives you the chills, or the hair goes up on the back of your head, and, you, and if you experience it, or some of you, if you cry that weekend in church, then you feel like you've ex experienced worship. That's a sign that you, you worship the, the Lord, and so some of us just kind of a vagueness of, what, what is worship? What's it mean to worship? I wrote down this, just kind of a definition for me. I put, it's being in awe of God, realizing who He is, and 
and what he has done for me and praising him for it. You ever come to the point where you just, you just realize, wow, God is big. God is great. He can handle my issues. He can handle my, my problems because he's huge. And he cared enough to die on a cross for my sins. And he's powerful enough and competent enough to resurrect from the death that even death couldn't keep him. And so he resurrected. And so I certainly can trust him because he's shown how powerful he is and how caring and loving he is. Well, fortunately, part of the Christmas story reveals to us how to worship. It's in there. We can learn. We can experience what it means to worship Jesus, the Savior. We're going to be reading from Matthew 2, 1 through 12. It's a section of scripture that covers part of the Christmas story. So we're going to read that. It's going to be on the screen if you wanted to get your own Bibles with you. We're in Matthew 2, 1 through 12. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. Now, interesting, I, I finally had time to, uh, to watch a DVD that Connie Summers gave to me, I think a couple of years ago, and it's a documentary on the star of Bethlehem. And it's covering external evidence that uh, from the area of astronomy that uh, shares and shows how accurate the Bible is. And so an amazing documentary. We'd love to show that to the whole church, maybe on a Sunday night or something, because I was just I was just taken in by it. I thought, wow, this is huge. This is, this is great. There was something that was happening in the sky uh, 3 to 2 B.C., uh, that you would be really interested in uh, that's uh, in consequence of, of, of the star of Bethlehem. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. Why do you think Herod was disturbed? Well, one, they're coming in to worship a king, certainly, but why is all Jerusalem disturbed also? Well, not only the king, who's a competitor of this new king, is disturbed, but all of Jerusalem, because back then there was no light... Um, this, uh, what you'd call light pollution. Thank you, Todd. Light pollution. And in the coolness of the night, people would sleep out on their rooftops in Palestine, and you would see the stars. Like when you're out backpacking, about the only other time I can just, just say that you can look at the stars and follow the skies in an amazing way, and you could actually, night after night, these people sleeping under the stars pay attention to the differences in space. They're able to, to see the changes in things. And so Jerusalem is disturbed also because these magi from the east are bringing an explanation to what they're seeing in the skies. And so it's disturbing. They're like, and then Herod's especially disturbed because it's like, oh, wow, that's why that's here. That, that, that's why that's there, and that's what's going on. And this is a sign. They believed in, in signs and things. And so this is what Herod does. When he had them... He, he, when he had called together all the people's chief priests and the teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least amongst the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from the exact time the star had appeared. He, then, he, he sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard, the, heard this, the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and frankincense and myrrh, and having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. So in this passage, we're going to learn and draw out of it how to worship the Savior. In case worship is something that's still kind of strange to you, or unless you're under the impression that, well, you go to a, a service, a church service, and there's a time of worship, and that means a singing time, and then there's a time where you listen to the preacher speak to you, and that's just like a proclamation time. Instead of seeing this all as our lives as an opportunity to worship God, and we can learn something a little bit more about the true meaning of worship and what it means in our lives. And so first... To start off with, it comes from the first verse in 2.1. Magi from the east came to Jerusalem. They came to Jerusalem. 
there was movement from a far distance away. Now, some people believe that uh, the Magi coming from the east, some scholars believe that this is, was an attachment uh, because uh, there's some other historians and things that there was other Magi. Some Magi were good, some were bad. These Magi from the east is believed to be the same people that were connected with Daniel. Daniel went over to Babylon, which we know is now Iraq, modern-day Iraq, and he was a wise man. He was able to interpret dreams for a king there. They were able to, to, to have a school of experts and consultants that were the king kingmakers. The Magi were kingmakers, the power behind the power. And they were very wise people, intellectual. They're in the arts and, and thinking and, and, and in all different ways. And so there's some that can believe they were from Babylon, from the east, and they made this big trek. It would have been a very expensive trek, a very, very expensive. Uh, they would have been people of means. But they were hungry to see what they wanted to see. It wasn't just an intellectual curiosity. Otherwise, they would have just stayed home and kept studying the stars. But the fact that there's probably some connection to Jewish descent they knew that there was to be a star, like these people that are consulting with Herod here in Jerusalem. And so they make the trek. I think we live in a culture where we've become sometimes so quite cynical, a lot because we have seen a cynicism that doubts whether what people are saying is what really what people are believing. With our politicians, you know, that throw out so many things, we kind of wonder, do they really believe that? Or are they just trying to get elected? Or are they just trying to get votes? Look at our pastors and churches and things. Do they really believe that? Or are they just after us? Is there some other agenda? Is there something that we're not seeing? With our police officers and things, when they run investigations, they might have the person in front of the microphone, and they'll have the entire police department behind them. Like, hey, we really mean business. We are really trying to track these people. We're really trying to, because we have such a skeptical public. Because we doubt whether what people are really saying is what they're believing. Comedian C.K. Lewis says this, I have a lot of beliefs, and I live by none of them. That's just the way I am. They're just my beliefs. I just like believing them. I like that part. They're my little believies. They make me feel good about who I am. But if they ever get in the way of, what, of the thing I want, I sure as heck just do what I want to do. And that might be America in kind of a nutshell when it comes to who we're listening to and what we'll do and what we'll believe and what we do with what we believe. We might see those kinds of things in other peoples and politicians and people and bosses and friends. We don't often say that about ourselves or see that in ourselves. But humorously, when, it, when words don't match our actions, there's a humorous part. There's a Christian music group that traveled over to Sweden, and they were going to stay with people and travel throughout the country with different church people. And, and one such couple of, of, of guys were going to uh, stay with some 60-year-old uh, couple that were in Sweden there. And... and um, that one of the guys decided to have a little fun with the couple that was driving them home to their, their hosting them for the, for the night. And as they were driving, uh, one guy said to the other, he said, these look like a nice people, but they're probably serial killers. And they're probably taking us out to the edge of town to, our, to, to take our lives and put us to our death. And the other guy kind of just chuckled along, and, and the Swedish couple kind of smiled at him and kind of just laughed, you know. And, and, and then they got home, and the Swedish couple gave them some tea and crackers and this really smelly, disgusting-looking white cheese. And the young man began again. He says, this cheese is disgusting as it smells. But he rubbed his tummy at the same time he was saying it. And the Swedish couple, while he was saying that, grabbed some more cheese and put more on his plate. There's just a, a difference between what he was saying and what he was really believing and meaning, and, and many times we're like that. But the Magi here, you can see, they meant, they meant it, they meant business. We might think it's funny when there's language barriers and with politicians or things about saying one thing and believing in another, but the Magi, they came with an attitude of worship. And so here's really the first point, is worship starts with a sincere desire. You might have to have movement. They moved a long way. It was an expensive thing. It was, it was a seeking, and they were hungry to, to worship. They meant it. Their thoughts and their beliefs and their actions went hand to hand. There was sincerity. Don't you love to be around sincere people that really mean what they say and believe what they say? I was talking to our staff meeting this week and, and, and talking about, you know, just the burnout amongst teachers and things. We have some people that have, you know, taught in the church, but they get burned out or different leaders in the church that get burned out and, you know, just no longer kind of as, as active as they used to be. And so I talked to the staff about just cautioning them and taking time to refresh and taking time to go back to the well and taking some time off 
from different leadership positions and things. And since Sue Thornton, our, our CDC director and one of our preschool teachers of those kids goes, wow, I don't even know any, you know, burnout. What's, you know, what's, what's burnout? And, and, and as she talked, we just realized in talking that she'd been teaching. And I said, for how many years is that, Sue? And it's like, I'm 28 some years teaching. It's like, yeah, and you've never really had a, a break or anything? She said, I don't, I just love the kids, and I love the, teaching them the Bible, and I love their facial expressions when they get something and how much they know how much God loves them. And I was like, wow, yeah, okay. So, Sue, I can see that you have a sincere desire to work with and love kids. It's just there. Because if you don't, if you don't even hardly feel it, because that's a lot of years working in that place. I, I still encourage people to take some time off. I still encourage the people to get in some adult Bible studies. still encourage people to, to refresh, but certainly people, you can tell when they have a sincerity. When they have a desire. It's a sincere desire. My own experience, I visited another church just a couple weeks ago. And what I noticed about it is I was waiting for 11 o'clock service, and I can't sleep in anymore. I haven't been able to sleep in for a few years now. And uh, and church started at 11 o'clock. And I noticed I got up, and and it was early. And so I waited for the kids to get up before I'm making them breakfast. Saw a little bit of a political show on TV. Went out and put some stuff away in the garage. Still not time for church. Uh, so I did, you know, a little vacuuming, a little bit of cleaning. The girls got up. I made them some breakfast and uh, started some laundry. Still not time for church. I think, what in the world are people saying out there about not having time enough for church? What else do you do? He said, because I, 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 I finally did get there at 1045, 15 minutes before this church start, start, started, and uh, joined the greeting team. I did, because I thought, well, I need something to do. I'm here early, and so I uh, began to greet people, and I uh, met a young man named Adam who just walked through that church down the street and greeted him, welcomed him to church, introduced him to the pastor. I was like, wow, this is, this is another church that I love. This is a church that's preaching the truth. This is a church, and, and, and I love, and I thought back to, well, this is so much different than Fairfield, because at Fairfield, I get up at 6 a.m., and I get to church by 7, and then prepare and, 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 and pray and wait for a group to come join me, a group of shepherds at 8, in which we have an opportunity to pray and discuss the things that are happening in the church. And so I, I, I think, wow, what a, what a difference when, when, when God's moving in the hearts of those people, and they say, you know, I want to be involved. I want to move in the direction of God. I want to do, I want to, I want to be, have more to the experience because it felt weird when I left that church service that morning. It was like, wow, is that it? Is that, is that what this church, this, I don't think I'd ever be able to do this. I don't think I could ever go and, and say my church experience is just this, this, this time. And so certainly I know that the Christian experience is much more than the worship service. Thankfully so. Wow, isn't there just this, when you have that sincere desire to just want to come together with other people, and hey, let's start a home Bible study. We've got some neighbors, we've got some people, there's plenty of people who don't know the Lord still. Let's get together for a Bible study. Hey, the churches have plenty of needs in, in the little kids department, taking care of kids. There's plenty of needs with campus life. It's got plenty of volunteers that are needed to disciple new kids coming to know Christ. I do an outreach, plenty of building needs, plenty of broken down building stuff, plenty of landscape. There's always plenty of stuff. And that's why the Bible says the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. But in an act of worship, the Magi responded with a sincere heart. They came. They went. They got involved. It wasn't enough to see from a distance. So we're going we got to see this for themselves. And there was a hunger. And when there's a hunger, when there's a fire underneath it, you'll know. You'll know. And you won't be satisfied until you feel like you can be a part of the way God is working and moving and even rejoicing in that. Verse 2, it says in 2, 2, Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews, they ask? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. See, they expected Jesus to show up. You can tell from what they say. They expected Jesus to be there. They expected the God to show up in this. Where's the one? He's been born king of the Jews. Like they were expecting the whole town. They walk into town there. There's a king Herod. They want to talk to him, but they want to talk to people. Hey, where's the, where's the king? Where's the one born king of the Jews? We saw a star in the east, and we've come to worship him. Isn't everybody here to worship him? There's a faith factor in our lives, and... In our, in our spiritual lives, it's impossible to please God, the Bible says, without faith. 
And, and faith is, is believing and knowing and with expectation that God is going to show up. When you come to worship Him, there is a great connection between expecting Him to be there and our attitude uh, uh, in, in finding Jesus in worship. There's a lot to this. If you would decide to gather here on Sunday mornings, if you just, before you come into the auditorium, you would just spend even 30 seconds in prayer with your family saying, God, this time is yours, not mine. And I pray that you would make it great. I pray that you would teach me something new today. I pray that you would stir my heart in some new way, or you would teach me something new and different. That you would make me different than I'm coming in. If we'd raise the expectation to that level, because I, I, I know there's the expectation sometimes for, for many of you, especially with the kids, is man, you scarf down with breakfast, you got the kids dropped off in the nursery over there, and, and you said to yourself, I don't care how bad the sermon is, I just have an hour of peace without anybody bothering me. But what if we raise the expectation to Lord speak to me? Your servant is listening. I'm a learner, I'm a doer of your word. So tell me. What do you want me to do? The Northwest Baptist Convention, we've been partnering just recently, these last couple years, with churches in China. And so we have an opportunity to send our pastors there. They're sending some of their pastors here and members of churches. And you, if you want to go to China, you can join right now. There's a missions groups that are going right at one after another over to China and uh, be part of what God is doing in, in that great country and uh, this pastor, uh, that, that when he wrote down, I was in Beijing, China. He says, and we went to church. It was a larger church in the town to worship. So we actually went an hour early because they wanted to show us the church building where the church service was. And when we got there, there were hundreds of people sitting outside singing. We asked, who are these people? We thought it was the choir, but it looked too big for a choir. They said, no, no, that's all the worshipers in the church. Everybody shows up an hour early so they can warm up their voices to sing. So when they get into worship, they can really sing in the right way to God. And so they spend an hour before being outside the building in expectation from moving in. This pastor in the Northwest was like, wow. Talk about building expectation for what God is going to do in the life of your church life of your church body. And so here's really the second point that the Magi teach us is that you develop an expectant spirit. Do you have an expectant spirit? Come expecting to see Jesus and worshiping him. You know, the story of the Magi, there's really three different responses that you see in the story. You've got the Magi, which had great expectations. It's like, whoa, we, you know, every step on their way from, from the east, wherever that east was, whether it was, was Babylon or, you know, whether it was Iraq or further out, as they each step, they're getting closer to the place where this, this star is, the place of the birth of this king. And so they're just great expectations. They're having conversations about it. Maybe they're singing songs. They're, 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 they're just thinking and expectation. Now, Herod, he represents the resistance. He didn't really want to, Jesus to show up. He saw Jesus as a threat. He thought, saw Jesus as a competitor. And that's why he killed all those little kids, uh, two, uh, two-year-old boys and under down in this area. Some of the secular community, they don't really want to see Jesus. They don't want him to show up. But that's them. Now, religious leaders is the third part. Because Herod goes to some religious leaders. And they know exactly where the king's going to be born. It's like, yep, we know it's prophesied. We read the scriptures, got it memorized. In Bethlehem, it's where it's prophesied. But you notice, they don't just follow the Magi five miles down the road, down to Bethlehem from Jerusalem. Just five miles to the south is all they go. But they are the indifferent ones. Herod's resistant, magi expectant, the religious leader, apathetic and indifferent. You know, today in the churches and the world today, we just see a great deal of apathy. A great deal, yeah, that's probably true. Yeah, I think I, I, think I believe that. But I got a lot going on in life. So, what do you want me to do? You know, I want you to expect Jesus to show up in your life. I want you to expect, have him expect to, to come into your life in a big way, in an overflowing way, in a, in a way where you can say, wow, I expected Jesus to show up big in my life, and he showed up big in my home. I, I wanted Jesus, I expected him to come alive, and he showed up in my marriage. I expected Jesus to come, and he, and he, and he came into my workplace, and he changed the environment there. I expected Jesus to come up and show up in my prayers, and he started showing up in my prayers because of this expectation, because of this faith. 
Because we know in the Bible, the Bible's pretty clear what God thinks about the lukewarm. And you know, be hot like the Magi, be cold like Herod, be lukewarm, I'm just going to throw you out, I'm going to spit you out. I can't stand that. Verse 10, next point, when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. They were overjoyed. Actually, the Greek word talks about literally uh, uh, not just being overjoyed, but ex overjoyed exceedingly to where it's not just, uh, just a smile on their face, but they were openly expressing it. It was a response. They were choosing uh, joy. And it was a joy that they would know soon enough that they were on track to find a joy that was not just temporary. So much of the way we talk about joy, sometimes what we really mean is happiness. Are you joyful? We mean, are you happy? And we got people like, oh, I'm happy sometimes because gangs are going good in life. Sales are up. You know, my kids are doing well. I'm healthy. I'm happy. Things are going bad. Marriage is falling apart. Relationships aren't going very good. Job, I don't even know if I'm going to have one. I'm sad. But joy means you've got happiness beyond whatever else is happening. It's not temporary. We look for the temporal fix in life. We look for a temporal joy. A little shot in the arm just to get us through the day as the different people escape or find different joys in different ways. You know, I was reading John Ortberg. He writes this little, uh, little article on temporary joy. He says, when we take our children to the shrine of the golden arches, they always lust for the meal that comes with a cheap little prize. A combination christened in the moment of marketing genius, the happy meal. You're not just buying fries, McNuggets, and a dinosaur stamp. You're buying happiness. Their advertisement has convinced my children that they have a little McDonald's-shaped vacuum in their soul. Our hearts are restless till they find the rest in a happy meal. I try to buy them off the kids sometimes. I tell them to order only the food, and I'll give them a quarter to buy a little toy on their own. But the cry goes up, I want a happy meal. All over the restaurant, people crane their necks to look at the tight-fisted, penny-pinching cheapskate of a parent who would deny a child the meal of great joy. The problem with the happy meal is that the happy wears off and they need a new fix. No child discovers lasting happiness just once. Remember the happy meal? What great joy I found there. Happy meals bring happiness only to McDonald's. You ever wonder why Ronald McDonald wears that grin? 20 billion happy meals, that's why. When you get older, you don't get any smarter. Your happy meals just get more expensive. Isn't that true? What kind of thing are you looking for your next fix or your next season of satisfaction in your life? Like, oh, when this happens, huh, then I will be joyful. When the kids get up and grown and move out, then I will be joyful. When our marriage gets a little better, my husband and my wife starts acting like they should, then, then joy will come to this place. When I have some friends just to go out with the guys, just to go out with the girls and have some time, that's when I will be happy. That's when I'll be joyful. Well, the Magi knew a joy that went beyond the circumstances. Choose to express joy. That's really the third point. Not just feel it, but to express it. C.S. Lewis says, joy is the serious business of heaven. And I'd say if you're not enjoying Jesus, if you're not enjoying your relationship with Jesus, you're not able to Worship the Lord. You're not able to express joy because joy and worship comes out of an expression of gratitude and thanksgiving. Joy is your response to the music the Holy Spirit is playing in your life. It causes you to dance even though the circumstances say that you should cry. Lee Strobel, he wrote for the Chicago Tribune for years. You probably know him now as a Christian author who wrote uh, Case for Christ, Case for Christmas, Case for Faith. He was a, 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 a a reporter for the Chicago Tribune, and he was also an atheist. And he met a couple, a family with some kids called the Delgados in the west side of Chicago, and around Christmas time was coming up, and uh, it was an impoverished place, living in an apartment with a lot of other impoverished people. And he decided on the, this, this group of people with these kids, the Delgados, to write an article about them as a human interest story. And he just did that in December, beginning of December, and it came Christmas Eve, and he thought, I'm going to stop by the Delgados and see how they're doing this Christmas, see if I can just bring some warm cheer to them. And he shows up at their house, and there are boxes of gifts and presents to the ceiling. There's new furniture. There's all kinds of new items that's stacked to the hilt in here. And he's like, man, what went on? And they said, oh, Mr. Mr. Strobel, Mr. Strobel, when you wrote your article, people just flooded us with gifts and of 
every kind, and they even gave us money. We're just loaded, you know, on things. He said, but Lee, Lee Strobel says what overwhelmed him more was that they were in the process of packing up all these gifts to take them to their neighbors. And we're just unloading this stuff as he was there to visit them. And he's like, what are you doing? You guys must feel like you've, you've finally made it. You've arrived. You've got all this cash and things. Aren't you just going to enjoy all this stuff? And I said, Mr. Strobel, we couldn't do that. Our neighbors are in such need. We've got to share with them. But it wasn't until Mrs. Delgado said, but this isn't the greatest gifts given anyway. That happens tomorrow at Christmas. It was the joy the Delgados had that was too much for him to over, overcome and, and overcame his atheism because it began from that point on his serious search for God. And not long after that, he gave his life to Christ as Savior. There's a joy there. The Magi knew about the joy of finding the King. And we can still experience that joy today when we find Jesus. Now, verse 11 says, On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. They bowed down to a baby. You know, that just uh, had, to be a, had to be an amazing scene, especially when you know who these magi are. The, you know, the kingmakers, the people behind the power, the power behind the power. You know, in the arts, in the mathematics, in the sciences, in the philosophy, these guys were it. And you just get a picture, and they're just sitting before a baby, bowing down to worship him. It had to look odd. If you think of the Warren Buffetts or the Bill Gates or the, you know, all the people behind, you know, that just can manipulate the economy, the top one percenters that, you know, have almost all, all the wealth and things. And, and you, just, you just think about these people, and you think of them bowing before a baby, and you think of the cliches about a baby is, you know, it's, it's like taking candy from a baby. You know, it's easy. You can, you know, babies sometimes get used, they get abused, they because they're helpless, they can't do anything for themselves, they get mistreated, sometimes they get shaken. Their very lives are so vulnerable just being alive. And these wise men are bowing before the baby. Thursday, I was writing this message still, and there was thunder and lightning that was just flashing outside my window of my office. And I began to think, man, God is just creating a show of fireworks today. And I think of, wow, all the man, men, in this world to just think they're so in control. And I think it's just a good reminder whenever you just see a big fireworks show of lightning and thunder and think, wow, that's real power. There's just so many men, women in this world just feel like they're so in control. They've got, you know, life by the horns. They've got all their plans and everything. And it's not until you get hit with some health crisis. It's not until you lose a job. It's not until you get shaken in some way you realize the illusion of the control that you thought you had. It's not like and for governments and people in politics, it's not until there's like a tsunami in Indonesia that just wipes out you know, a population of people. Or it's not like a Hurricane Sandy or Hurricane Katrina that you realize how inept the government is to protect you and provide for you and all the things that many people many times look for a government to do. Well, the Magi had figured out that there was something about this baby that transcends what man can do. So really the point here is decide to humble yourself. Decide if you want to worship the Lord, you will not be able to worship him unless you humble yourself. If there's pride in your life, it'll be hard to worship. You're going to have to come before the Lord to start before you worship. You're going to have to come and confess your pride to him before you even get started. If there's unforgiveness or anything else or any haughtiness or arrogance because you're holding yourself over somebody else, you've got to confess that or you won't be able to worship. The Magi start by bowing down, humbling themselves, even though they were great, even though they were big here. But compared to this baby, it's nothing. David Brooks writes an article called We're an Overconfident Species. He says, when pollsters ask people from around the world to rate themselves on different traits, Americans usually supply the most positive self-ratings. Although American students do not perform well on global math tests, they are amongst the world's leaders in having self-confidence about their math abilities. Compared to college students from 30 years ago, today's college students are much more likely to agree with a statement such as, I am easy to like. 94% of college professors believe they are above average teaching skills. 
70% of high school students surveyed claim they have above average leadership skills. Only 2% are below average. Brooks observed that a few decades ago, it would have been unthinkable for a baseball player to celebrate himself in the batter's box after hitting a home run. Today, it's routine. Similarly, pop singers wouldn't have com composed songs about their own greatness. Now those songs dominate the charts. The number of high school seniors who believed that they were a very important person in the 1950s was 12%. In the 1980s, 90%. According to Brooks, American men are especially susceptible to the perils of overconfidence. Men intentionally drown twice as often as women because men have a great faith in their swimming ability, especially after drinking. In short, Brooks concludes, there's abundant evidence to suggest that we have shifted from a bit from a culture that emphasized self-effacement, I'm not better than anybody else, but nobody is better than me, to a culture that emphasizes self-expansion. We've become more of a bragging and boastful culture where we share not about our weaknesses or not about our struggles, but we routinely share about all the things we can do, all our strengths and how we can add value to an employment place, or how we can uh, add value to, to, to a, a conference, how we can avow, uh, value to the church. You need me. You want me on your board. You want me as, as your friend. I'm, I'm good at these things. You want me to help you. Because, because, because. Well, then it says in verse 11, they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. They gave him gifts. The most famous thing that we know the wise men to do is right here in an act of worship is they gave him their gifts. Worship's just not taking in. Some people say, I want to go to worship to be fed. I want to be fed. I want to be fed. I want to be fed. But worship is more about giving back to God. Because that whole definition about realizing what God has done for us, how much he loves us, what he's done for us. And we want to give back something to him by just giving him back ourselves. Giving our love to him because he first loved us. Well, these wise men, they brought something to Jesus that of great value. They didn't understand all the dynamics of their gifts and what they meant even at the time but it foreshadowed several things they brought to jesus something though that definitely cost them something but the point here in this is when we worship the lord we need to give him your gifts give him your gifts offer him those things that you have offer him all that you are to him as a gift we have clues about these gifts that the magi gave to jesus way back one they gave him gold you know what gold represented they knew jesus was king and so they gave him their best. Gold is still like the best. You're king of my life. And so they gave him gold. Secondly, they gave him frankincense. You know what frankincense was? It was used for by the priests in the temple that would use frankincense. When people would come confess their sins and things, they would have uh, incense go up. It was frankincense to help with, you know, the idea of the forgiveness going up. And now there's a sweet aroma of frankincense covering up all the, you know, the terrible uh, the, the things and the sins. It was just part of, uh, of that uh, forgiveness. And so uh, you actually bring the Lord your worse. Frankincense was kind of a symbol recognizing him not only as king, but recognizing him as priest. We can read through Hebrews about how Jesus is our high priest. And the Magi bringing frankincense at the beginning was acknowledging that this is, this is Jesus, our priest. And they gave him myrrh. You know what myrrh is? Something they would embalm bodies with. That's how they'd wrap people in cloth, but they'd, they'd put it in, in ointments of, 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 of myrrh in it, and, and, and it would help the body to be embalmed. So they were recognizing him as Savior. He was going to one day die for the sins of the world. What's the gift you want to give the Lord? Is the gift of recognizing his forgiveness? Is it the gift of recognizing a, a relationship decision that needs to be made? A gift of recognizing a new habit in your life that will draw closer to him? A gift of change in your life that needs to be made? Is it a, a gift of hope that you haven't had hope? Or you're like, Lord, I haven't been trusting you because you're the God of hope. Whatever gift that he's calling you to give back to him, Give it to him, whether it's your service, whether it's your resources, whatever God's asking you to give, it's like, hey, he's worthy of it, isn't he? Finally, verse 12, the Magi 
of having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they return to their country by another route. Sounds like they met with the Lord. They met with God. And God told them to do something, the next step. And they did it. It often happens that God tells us what to do next, what the next step is. And it's just a question of whether we're going to be obedient to it. But that is certainly a step of worship. The point here is end with an obedient response. You want to worship the Lord? Make sure you end your worship by doing what he says. And, and, and notice, it says they went back by another route. If there's anything I've noticed about worship, it's that often my route gets changed. I have come into worship before. I've come into this auditorium with maybe the wrong attitude. I've come in with a bad attitude. And you're thinking, wow, pastors sometimes have bad attitudes. Absolutely. Pastors come in unprepared to preach. There's times where I come in here and things have happened before, you know, even got to the auditorium that could be frustrating, that could be uh, kind of give me a downcast spirit, could, could, could be, ah, oh, someone, you know, quit doing this. I'm not going to do this anymore. Someone's mad at this person. Someone's, and you're already kind of doing some arbitration before you even make it to the auditorium. And I come in and I begin to, to, to lift up the Lord in praise and songs, and my heart begins to change. It gets rerouted before I even get up here to preach. I'm like, wow, thanks, Lord, for the worship team this morning because my heart is now ready to truly recognize that you are greater than all the little stuff I've been going through this morning. We go a different direction. There's times in life where God's asking you to do something. God is saying, do this. Do this. You say, oh, I, I can't do that. Alan, Alan, I will raise my hands in worship. I'll even start giving a little bit more in church, put more in the offering plate. Alan, I will, I will listen to your sermons a little bit more, not fall asleep as often. I, I will just like, I will do so many things, but not that. And that's the thing the Lord has asked you to do. You know, he might say, hey, you've got to salvage this. You've got to make that right with that person. He already said sorry to me. God's saying, hey, You've asked for forgiveness for me, you're forgiven. Now go to this person and reconcile the relationship. I can't do that. I can't do that. I can sing. I can give. I'm worshiping you, Lord. Just take that worship. And the Lord says, no, nah, no, nah. not until you reroute. Not until you come in, interact with me, and go out a different way. We have a worship until you've got me. And that's where people stop. American church, we generally so just put all kinds of resources and time and energy in the arts of worship and pay pastors and teachers and leaders on TV. We got them on the radio. We got them everywhere. We got CDs with the best worship music ever known before this century. But we need to reroute. We need to come in one way and go out a different way. pastor friend who grew up going to church at his grandma's house on Sundays. He said so instead of his parents taking him to his grandma's house he would just jump in the car with grandma and grandpa and he says there's this one thing my grandma would always say on the way home. She would say this is the one thing I'm going to do now based on what I heard this morning. I, ca I call it the takeaway. You know there's one I go to conferences and different things all the time and I try and like Make it worth my time. What's one nugget I could do? What's one thing I could grab onto that's worth changing? Today? A good nugget of truth. And even grab onto a nugget of truth and, 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 and observe that and then live it out. You're making headway with it. Well, Grandma here is just it's the one thing. And she wouldn't say that, you know, force other people to speak up, but it would force other people in the car to think, what's the one thing? I'm going to take away with? What's the one thing I'm going to be different because of what I heard this morning? There's actually the idea of implementation, the, the, the idea of obedience. I, I'm told and, and, and told many times that 50% of Christian parents have spiritual discussions with their kids uh, outside the church. I mean, 50% of parents are never talking to their kids about the Lord and things outside the walls of the church. So they're not even having a discussion on the car ride home or in their homes or devotionals or other things. We're saying, hey, kids, how are you doing with the Lord? How's your walk with the Lord? How, which ways are you growing? What are your favorite verses? Our obedience is so key to worship. 
the catalyst, the catalyst for God's blessing is our obedience. Because God's not going to bless something that is wicked. God is not going to bless something that's not right with him. Lots of times we're like, well, I'm going to do this anyway. Why isn't God blessing me? Why isn't my life not getting better? Why is my life not flourishing? Why, why is there emptiness? Why, why am I struggling so much? Well, are you, are you walking right with the Lord? No? Well, why are you expecting blessing to come then? Our obedience is the catalyst for God's blessing. And it's more than a song. And it's more than giving. And it's more than listening. It's a lifestyle. Your life is your worship to God. He wants you. He wants your heart. And as you go out from here, you're worshiping. Way more time out the week than the hour that you're here. Proclamation of the word, part of worship. Singing songs, part of worship certainly not of it. I have a song that I like to sing by myself and prayer times because it just says this. It's just a reminder to me like uh, worship just doesn't happen in the auditorium, Alan. It's, it's a lifestyle. It's how you raise your family, raise your kids, how you love your wife, how you do your job, the kind of person you are when you're all by yourself. And so I sing this song because it says that. So just kind of pray it with me. When the music fades, all is stripped away, and I simply come, longing just to bring something back again that will bless your heart. I'll bring you more than a song, for a song in it is not what you have required. You search much deeper within than the way things appear. You're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to a heart of worship, and it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the things I've made in. When it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. In your endless words, no one could express how much you deserve. Though I'm weak and poor, all I have is yours. Every single breath, I'll bring you more than a song, for a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within, through the way things appear, you're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship and it's all about you it's all about you Jesus I'm sorry Lord for the things I've made in when it's all about you it's all about you Jesus I hope that's uh, I hope that's our prayer that's the invitation is to try for our be our prayer, for that to be our, our wake up song, be our reflection with the Lord is Lord, this it's not about me. It's not about people, it's not about governments, it's about you and what you're doing in our life today. That's the invitation today. And the worship team is gonna sing this praise and worship song. And I pray that you would just uh, reflect on it as you sing it with your whole heart, with your whole voice and worship him in spirit and in truth and with your lungs as we just lift up the Lord. Stand with me at this time, would you, as we sing with the worship team. I'm going to be just in the back down the, down the hall in the connection room to receive you if there's just things you want to discuss from the service this morning, from the, the message.
But let's worship the Lord right now. Lift up your arms and hands and voices.